After I posted my last video, I did another deployment of the latest code that I had in my master branch. In this latest build, the game was running really slowly on some laptops, which wasn't very noticeable to me because I mostly code on my desktop, which was an interesting lesson learned. I should test my game on the device that I want to target. When I began to investigate, I discovered that rendering was taking way too long, especially for a game like mine with pixel art graphics. I had been a bit lazy with setting up my rendering code, but now seemed like a good time to try and optimize it. I had an idea of what the root cause would be, but I decided to still do some CPU profiling to see if what was turning red. According to my profiling graph, I saw that most of the time was spent executing the render pass. This was because I copy all the mesh data to the GPU every single frame. I decided that I can make the mesh object the main object that holds geometry data. Then I would just need a way to decide which meshes to cache on the GPU. A few situations came to mind. First I wanted to cache geometry that never changes. Second I wanted to cache geometry that was really big. Most of my game is made up of small sprites, each comprised of two triangles. These and other small geometry I wanted to dynamically batch into larger draw calls, especially if they're moving or animating frequently. But I also had some very static things like tile maps and a bunch of non-changing entities like trees and walls. These I wanted to batch once and cache forever. So I decided to batch the game world into static, geographical sections called chunks. The one notable downside here is that this would make animating the tiles more difficult. If I wanted to change one tile, I'd have to invalidate that chunk's tile almost every frame, which wouldn't be very efficient. I don't have any animated tiles yet, but I think if I do add some, I'll likely add them as an uncached dynamic layer on top. But that's a problem for future me. Because I now want to start caching meshes, I now need to check if a mesh has changed. Obviously, I could compare two meshes, or compare the hashes of the meshes, but both of these options seemed way too slow. I could also have two boolean states, dirty and clean, setting the mesh to dirty when the mesh gets changed, and setting it to clean when the mesh gets cached. The downside with the solution is that, if multiple subsystems each want to cache the mesh, then the mesh would have to have a dirty and clean flag for each subsystem. This seemed way too confusing and hard to track. Luckily, I had read this article which talked about generational IDs for entity component system frameworks. In the ECS world, they're often used to disambiguate two different entities that have the same ID. Usually this is caused by one entity being deleted and the second entity being added with the same ID shortly after. I realized that this sort of pattern could work for me too, where I want to disambiguate two mesh caching states, one before the mesh is updated and one after the mesh is updated. So I added a field to my mesh object called generation, which is incremented every time the mesh changes. Then each subsystem can decide if the mesh it has needs to be recached by comparing the mesh's generation to the generation ID that it had previously cached. The next low-hanging optimization is camera culling. It's pretty simple, but if you haven't heard of it before, all we have to do is check if an object is inside the camera's view before drawing it. So I just calculate a rectangle of what the camera can see, then every time I want to draw a sprite, I first check if the bounds of the sprite is colliding with the bounds of the camera. I also added a graph because I wanted to compare my performance before and after the rendering changes. This new graph measures the frame time between each frame. With these two changes, I was able to make our rendering frames take about 10x less time. Next I worked on adding a minimap. That way the player can see a slightly larger view of the world around them. Also with the improved rendering implementation, I finally had a bit more wiggle room to add some more graphical features. I had a few ideas on how to do this, and I'm not going to go into each of them here, but I'll cover what I ended up doing. First I rendered all of the map geometry to two frame buffers. A big frame buffer to be shown on the main screen, and a small frame buffer to be shown in the minimap. When I render to the minimap, I use a camera which is more zoomed out than the normal camera. That way the player can see more on the minimap. Because the minimap frame buffer is only 50 by 50 pixels, everything is pixelated which gives it this nice blocky effect. Lastly, I draw things like players and monsters to the minimap as colored squares, making the main player white, friendly players blue, and enemies red. Next I wanted to work on making my game easier to deploy and monitor. My previous deployment scripts were a mess, and it was making me reluctant to deploy anything at all, so I went down the path of setting up something like a CI CD system for the game. I opted to use GitHub Actions, but I also decided to wrap my build scripts in a makefile in case I ever decided to move to some other CI platform. Here's how it came together. On the front end, my repository produces three binaries, one for Windows, one for Linux, and one for WebAssembly. Then on the back end, it produces two Docker images, one for the proxy and one for the main game server. In my workflow, I build all of these artifacts and then upload them to the cloud. For the Docker images, I chose to use GitHub's container registry. For the client binaries, I chose to use Google Cloud Storage. GitHub also has a place to store artifacts, but I found their API to be more complicated than the Google Cloud Storage. I tag each build artifact with the commit hash of the repository it was built from. This lets me easily identify which binary came from which commit. To deploy my backend, I wrote a small docker compose file that launches and connects both of my docker images. Then to deploy my client, I download the binary, copy it to my website, and deploy it through Firebase. I originally wanted to use docker in the default bridge networking mode, but this seemed to cause a NAT layer to be put in front of all of my containers. For most services this wouldn't be a problem, but because I'm using WebRTC I can't have a NAT layer in front of my proxy, because I don't know what port will be used to establish the WebRTC connection. Or, at least I think that's the problem. So I set up my proxy container to use host networking mode which gives it full access to the host networking stack, effectively removing the pesky NAT layer. 
Next, I wanted to set up some monitoring for my applications. This is generally a good practice so that you can keep an eye on resource usage and also check if you have any leaks. But it also lets me expose metrics straight from my game, like number of active players and things like that. Also, now that I've integrated with Docker, it's really easy to add more monitoring utilities. I opted to use Prometheus and Grafana because they seem like the recommended approach, and so far I'm pretty pleased. After maybe a week of work, I'm happy to have a much more stable deployment system with all monitoring included. Anyways, that's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.